Dr. Keim, congratulations on Thank you. 30 years. Thank you very much. 30 year anniversary, 30 year celebration. Talk about what that means to you on a personal and professional level and what it means to this university institutionally. Well, it's gonna be hard to get a straight answer out of me, Mitch, because one of the things that somebody said to me is that we're so glad you did this before, you're before you die, <laughs> before you died. It's like, well, come on guys, this is a celebration. And, you know, 30 years was a good round number. And, you know, we've had over a thousand people come through the program in those 30 years. Uh, go on, and they've gone on to do just spectacular things. And so this was an opportunity to invite some of those folks back to acknowledge what they had done after they had left and to build a camaraderie in the community for uh, doing more in the future. Go back 30 years ago now. Could you have envisioned then, or did you envision then, what it would be like 30 years later, as no. in right now? Uh, there's no way, right? And so, in fact, uh, when you're a young faculty member trying to set up a program, mostly what you're doing is just trying to keep your head above water because, uh, you know, it's a new job. There's so many things going on. You're teaching, you're writing grants, and it, it, it becomes overwhelming at times. And in fact, my advice to young faculty is just hang in there, get the job done on a day-to-day -day basis, and good things will happen. And great things aren't going to happen every day, but just doing your job, checking the box, punching the clock is something you just have to do and hang in there and good things will happen. 30 years is a long time in science. A lot of things can change in a much shorter period of time, as we both know. But as you reflect on the last three decades of the Kind Genetics Lab, what types of changes have you seen that have been the most profound? The, the DNA sequencing technology has changed really dramatically. 30 years ago, we were sequencing DNA at NAU, but we were doing a few hundred nucleotides, a few hundred bases at a time. You know, today we'll sequence a thousand, a thousand genomes a month. And, you, you know, so that level of, of, of power to do genomic analysis was inconceivable 30 years ago. Well, remember, none of us had cell phones, right. you know? The uh, Apple, so the Pixel 3 phone I bought last week is more powerful than the mainframe computers were 30 years ago. Wow. So the, the increase in our ability to, to analyze big, big data sets was one of the things that allowed genomics uh, to move forward. Now, some of it was the machines that actually generate the data, but uh, even 10 years ago, we couldn't have handled the data sets that we generate today with the computers that we had. What, what does that allow the lab to do today that it couldn't do 30 years ago? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we could think about analyzing the genetics of people or soybeans or anthrax, and we could work on a problem for six months or 12 months and accomplish something, but get really unique insights into people or soybeans or anthrax. But now what we do is we can do that study on any organism, thousands of different organisms, and we can do it in a week. And we can do all of that in a week because we've uh, figured out how to generate the data, analyze the data, and interpret the data in a much more efficient and accurate fashion. You know, if you try to think fast forward now a little bit as you know we've been reflecting over the past 30 years yeah is there any way for you to put into some perspective today the next 30 or if that's too far the next 10 boy even that's hard yeah you know if I could do that I could make gazillions of dollars right hmm. <laughs> because we're in an environment that we call uh, where we get disruptive technology right you know, the things that we were using and were just super uh, cool and powerful 10 years ago, some of those are totally gone now because a new technology would come in. It would be so revolutionary and different, it would just drive that one out of the business. You know, whole companies that were based upon those technologies rose up, were on the S&P 500, and now are gone. Mm -hmm. And so to predict what's going to be happening in, in 10 years, is still really difficult because uh, the, everything is changing so, so fast. I think one of the big uh, advances that we're already seeing its impact is in artificial intelligence. So with these massive data sets, sometimes it's hard for us to uh, take the time to sit down and figure out what's going on. 
artificial intelligence then is a tool that we can use to help us understand our data better. And uh, I can think of five projects right now in my lab where artificial intelligence, machine learning, is changing the way that we function. There are some out there who have talked about the fear of AI. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's look at Dr. Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking. Well, predicted that AI could be the end of, of the human race as we know it. But I'm not hearing that fear in you, Dr. Keim, about AI. I, I guess I am a little afraid, you know. I think that uh, it will change what happens and we're not sure exactly how that's going to occur. Uh, but in general, uh, I only worry about things that I can c control. And mm -hmm. I ha hate to say it, but uh, artificial intelligence is out of my control. <laughs> you know, it's developing in ways that are beyond what the U.S. government, for example, could c control. I mean, this is a global phenomenon. Uh, some of the leaders in this are not always in the United States. But I don't worry about uh, artificial intelligence too much because I, I have no control over that. You have no control over that. Uh, it's going to happen, and I think we need to watch it. Uh, but we're not going to be able to control that very easily. Is there any way for, for you to be able to put in the words the importance of the Kime Genetics Lab to Northern Arizona University? The, the, the relationship that exists between the two has been a powerful one that has grown over the past 30 years. Is there any way to kind of frame that from your perspective? Well, I, I think, of course, we've accomplished wonderful things scientifically. We've brought in uh, lots of money. We've trained lots of students. Uh, we've raised the reputation of NAU in many ways due to our media exposure, especially mm -hmm. during the anthrax letters. But, uh, you know, I think what we've done that has been the most profound is, is we broke the model. And so there was a model for how you did do research at NAU. And uh, we broke that. We did something outside the box. And when we did that, it opened the door for lots of other folks. Right now at NAU, we have a, just a, a plethora of fantastic researchers who are growing up and building their own programs. And in the old days, uh, they wouldn't have had that chance because uh, they would have been pigeonholed into a particular model for what a research faculty member should be. And because we came in, we broke the model, we succeeded in, in a fashion that nobody anticipated, uh, it opened up people's minds about what a faculty member at NAU could be and what research models could be used at NAU. Uh, and um, I think that that may be what we did that was the most impactful. Paul, you mentioned earlier the, the number 1,000, as in more than 1,000 students yeah. at Northern Arizona University have been touched and have been a part of the KGL over the last 30 years. Frame that also. What does that mean to you? And, and talk about that impact on the students that have had the opportunity to be able to study at NAU at the Kime Genetics Lab. Yeah, it, it's uh, I, something I'm really proud of is the way that we've developed a program that trains students in research. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I. Over 30 years, there's no way I could have personally trained a thousand students in the way that I would like to. And so what we developed in the early years of the Kime Genetics Lab was a model where we train the trainers. Mm -hmm. And so a student comes in, we like students to come into the laboratory their sophomore year, maybe second semester freshman year. We are gonna invest in that student. We're gonna train that student in, in how to do science. And then next year, we want them to train the next student. And so, you know, I have some highly paid uh, employees who work for me. I don't want them training every undergraduate student. I want them to supervise, and I want the undergraduate students to be training the next generation, and the next generation, we're talking about one year, the next round of students. So by training the trainer, we've been able to leverage those, you know, highly skilled scientists that are in my group. We leverage their time and we end up being able to you know, educate you know, six or 700 undergraduate students. Out of that thousand, some of them were undergraduates, most of them were undergraduates. And it was uh, the process of, of the trainers, these undergraduate students are training the next round, that's also a developmental process. You know, if, if you have to teach somebody something, mm -hmm. you know it so much better than if you just learned it once. And so the train the trainers model has allowed us to leverage, you know, really good people. Dr. Paul Keim, congratulations on 30 years. Thank you, man. 30 years of the Keim Genetics Lab here at NAU, and thanks for joining us on Inside NAU. You're very welcome.